Blessed art thou, O Christ our God, who hath revealed the fishermen as most wise, having sent upon them the Holy Spirit, and through them thou hast fished the whole universe, O lover of mankind, glory to thee. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Well, today is the Holy Pentecost. And it today is also God's saving dispensation is completed. The Spirit descends from heaven upon the disciples, and those who once hid for fear of the Jews are endued with power from on high for their proclamation of the gospel. The Son who made known his divine Father unto mankind now sends down upon them the Holy Spirit, granting them all divine adoptions as sons of God. With this gift there are no distinctions, neither Jew, Greek, bond, free, male or female. In Christ all are made heirs of Abraham and inherit the same promise, all partakers of the one spirit. Remember Christ is the seed of Abraham, Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. We all come to share in the very life of God who is made fully manifest today with the descent of the third person of the Holy Trinity. After the mighty rushing wind and the cloven tongues of fire, the apostles went out to preach the good news. In the Greek language, the word for the gospel is evangelion, which really means the good news. The good news of the Orthodox Church, Orthodox Christianity, is the proclamation of God's unbounded and sacrificial love for mankind, as well as the revelation of the true destiny of the human person. So, Peter went and preached the good news as Christ commanded, but he wasn't by himself. So what did he preach from? Did he uh, preach out of the New Testament? No, because it didn't exist yet. So he came from the book of Joel, the prophet Joel. That Peter standing up with the eleven, so the whole, all of the apostles were together, he lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunk, as ye suppose, seeing it is but only the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord's coming. And it shall be come to pass that whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, for I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made me known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, 
Let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did seek corruption. This Jesus God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when the crowd heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that day 3,000 were added to the church. If you go back in history, when Moses drew a line in the sand and said, choose this day who you will serve, the ones that did not cross that line were slain, and it was 3,000. Isn't that amazing? 3,000 back in Moses' time, now 3,000 coming into the church at Pentecost. That Pentecost when Peter preached to the crowd, Jerusalem was very crowded. It was a very crowded city because of the Jewish feast of Shavuot, which is also known as Pentecost. And what is that? What is Shavuot? It's the second of the three pilgrim festivals of the Jewish religious calendar. And that's revealed in Leviticus chapter 23. It's an agricultural festival marking the beginning of the wheat harvest. So pay attention now when I'm talking about the wheat harvest. The feast before this feast was called first fruits. The first fruits of the crops were dedicated unto the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ accomplished this feast by presenting to the Father a first fruit offering of the saints that had rolled out of the graves at the earthquake when the Lord died on the cross. After the Lord's resurrection, he raised these saints and presented them to the Father as a first fruit offering. Jesus being our first fruits, and then he brings a first fruit offering to the Father, following the Jewish law. Hopefully we experience this Pentecost today with fullness clearly, if not every day of our Christian life. So what are the signs of this experience? What are the conditions for its occurrence? Do we really know that the Holy Spirit is present with us? How can we open ourselves up to the descent and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit? Can we too experience this miracle of Pentecost? St. Seraphim Aserov teaches us in the plainest language that the purpose of the Christian life is the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. Not just the monastics, but all Christians. It's not reserved for the monastics. It's for all of us. And when did that happen? Remember what Peter said to the crowd. Be baptized. And so, baptism, which leads to chrismation, is the sealing of that Christian by holy miron into the Holy Spirit. And they say, well... Okay, I've been chrismated. Now I have the Holy Spirit. Well, there's an interesting concept there going on. You get all of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit doesn't get all of you. So that's what our theosis is, our process of time of surrendering our will onto the will of God. And as we uh, daily, uh, in our daily theosis, as we surrender our will onto the Lord, and we feel the power of the Holy Spirit increasing in our life. 
just as a rich man can constantly concern with how to hold on to the wealth that they already amassed and how to add to it steadily day by day, we should have a clear sense as faithful, baptized, orthodox Christians just what our treasure is and how we can always be adding to it, increasing our talents, increasing our faith. You know, there's a lot of talk about speaking in tongues. The Greek word, there is a Greek word it calls glossolalia. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Glossolalia is the Greek word for speaking in tongues. But we heard in the epistle today, they didn't speak in tongues as we think, like the Pentecostals do. They were speaking in the language of that big crowd in Jerusalem so they could hear what? The good news about Christ Jesus. Have you ever heard any Pentecostal say, uh, well, you, you can't, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Well, that's rubbish. So I'm not going to talk about tongues today, speaking in tongues. I just want to stay with the scripture saying and what we heard in the epistle today, that they glorified God in Jerusalem because of the Feast of Pentecost, the Jewish Feast of Shavuot, the wheat harvest, Interesting that they call it the wheat harvest, but the Pentecost, the 3,000 were brought into the church that day. And by those, maybe that's that wheat harvest, bringing, bringing the people whose heart is prepared to receive God. Sadducees and Pharisees had an issue with that. They fought Jesus all the way down the line, even to the point of, mob rule taking him to Golgotha and crucifying him so the spirit the Holy Spirit endowed the apostles with the miraculous ability to speak another language in order to preach the gospel to all the foreigners in Jerusalem after all the spirit descended on the apostles themselves and not on the people moreover why would the locals in Jerusalem suppose the apostles were drunk if their words did not sound strange and in, incomprehensible to them. It seems clear then that they saw and heard these unlearned Galileans speaking in strange new tongues and these people misinterpreted what they saw out of malice and they mocked that miracle instead of glorifying the power of God. We see that happening all through history. Mocking the miracle instead of glorifying the, our Lord. Once we grasp the nature of this gift, it is, its meaning becomes clear. The Spirit descended on the apostles in the form of tongues, cloven tongues of fire, that they might be able to preach the gospel to all the nations. Before Christ ascended into heaven, Jesus commanded them to bear witness to his resurrection and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This was a specific command. Now that Christ is glorified, he gives his disciples the gracious gifts necessary to carry out his command. What would that be like if you were told to go cook a meal in the kitchen and you had no pots or pans to cook the meal? So you have all the equipment you need to be like the apostles and preach the good news. The same spirit that once confused the tongues of, in Babel of old now comes down to Jerusalem and restores their primal unity so as to facilitate the spread of the gospel. Isn't that amazing? We had at the Babel confusion of tongues, but today, I mean, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, the apostles spoke in different languages so that people could be unified in the good news of Jesus Christ. There's power. And the proof of that is, was Peter a coward when Jesus was arrested and taken into the trial? He denied the Lord, didn't he? And the Lord even prophesied to Peter that he would do that. And Peter said, no, I will never deny you, Lord. And then he did, and the cock crowed, and he wept bitterly. 
But then he comes to the Pentecost, Jerusalem, and with boldness shares the good news of his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We all can, as I said, enter in into the Holy Spirit. So indeed the gifts of the Holy Spirit are distributed according to the needs of the whole body of, church, of the church, of the whole body of the church. They're not for you to puff up with pride, but it's for the building up of the body of Christ, these gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us. As Elder Macarius of Aptina said, they are distributed by God according to the measure of a person's humility. Or that key word again, humility. Remember what happened in heaven when the angels fell. Because of pride, they became demons. But those who were full of humility stayed in heaven. Two-thirds stayed in heaven. So, we should not concern ourselves with the spiritual gifts for their own sake, for God requires us, requires of us, rather, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the litmus test of, are you being filled with the Holy Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And you can find that in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. These fruits and these alone bear witness to the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our lives. It's an inside job. Holy Spirit is residing in our heart. And because of the Holy Spirit residence in our heart, that we manifest physically the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But the devil works it the opposite way. He brings condemnation and he works through the five senses on an outside job. He always attacks on the outside, through the eyes, the, the mouth, the nose. I mean, there's a five senses. He can set up the traps. But we, see, Satan brings condemnation. But the Holy Spirit brings conviction, difference. These gifts of the Holy Spirit that we are supposed to be Increasing our, our true spiritual riches, our treasure laid up in heaven, the talent hid in the field of our heart. The gifts of the Spirit may be given us at God's discretion. St. Paul even exhorts us to desire them, to purify ourselves so that we may be worthy of receiving these gifts of the Holy Spirit. But what if we don't have the fruits of the Holy Spirit? St. Paul says, we can confidently say that speaking in tongues is not the definite sign of the Holy Spirit's presence. It is not necessary for salvation, nor even to fully experience the gift of Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit. So how do we access this reality? Again, in the book of Acts, gives us an indication when we hear that on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were all with in one accord and in one place. Acts chapter 2 verse 1. The miracle and experience of Pentecost is corporate. It occurs when the whole body is assembled with one accord. This is what happens at every divine liturgy. We see why it's so important, essential, really for us to be at peace with each other in order to participate in this divine liturgy. And what do we say at the beginning of the liturgy? In peace, let us pray unto the Lord. I will say that's a command. How can you pray to the Lord when you have issues with your brother or sister? Doesn't the scripture say go and make peace with your brother or sister, then come back? and offer your sacrifice unto the Lord? Before the anaphora, in the liturgy, all the priests greet with one another with a kiss of peace. And I believe that all of us, we should do that. 
Before the consecration of the Eucharist, the presiding priest calls upon the same Lord who sent down the Holy Spirit at the third hour upon the apostles and asks him to renew that spirit in us and to send down that Holy Spirit in order to consummate or change the gifts, this mystery of the gifts into the very body and blood of Christ. So this miracle of Pentecost is repeated in our church every single time we come together with one accord to celebrate the Eucharist. It's basically a continuation of Pentecost. We are called to manifest the miracle of Pentecost, not simply one or two days out of the week, but every evening, morning, noonday, and every moment of our life. Well, I've got a lot of work to do. We are truly to be a Pentecostal community, not the aberration of the Pentecostals, but the true Pentecostal community. The concord of the disciples preceded the descent of the Spirit, but in the wake of Pentecost, the example of peace and concord of mutual love and support spread throughout the whole community of believers, which numbered in the thousands and that grew daily. They tried to extinguish Christianity. They didn't. St. Luke tells us that we, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and prayers and all that believed were together and all had these things in common. They even sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 46. That was a common life in Christ in the first century. When the persecutions ended in the church and began receiving patronage from the Roman state, the institution of monasticism arose to preserve the zeal and purity of faith of the apostles and the early church. The flame that was kindled on the first Pentecost has been preserved uninterrupted in the church to this day, thanks in no small part to the monastics that have preserved that. The responsibility now falls onto us to keep the flame lit, to live out and bear witness to the Pentecostal mystery, the descent of the Holy Spirit and His abiding in our midst. We will certainly experience His descent and presence if we strive among all else to live in peace with one another, to always come together in one accord. Then David's words will be fulfilled in us, how good and how joyous it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the oil of myrrh running down the beard of Aaron, like the dew of Hermon coming down upon Mount Zion. Psalm 132. These are all figures of the spirit that Christ sends down upon those who live with one heart as brethren. And this is the fullness of the spiritual life to which we aspire and which is offered unto us today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory forever.